Okay, we're live. Hello, everybody. Chad Blair with Honolulu Civil Beat. And this is the fifth installment of our series interviewing the top gubernatorial candidates, the Democrats and the Republicans here in the state of Hawaii. Please uh, help me welcome our special guest tonight, Republican State Minority Leader, Andrea Tapola. All right. You watch that now. Not too much of that. <laughs> Uh, before uh, we get to our format with uh, Representative Tupola, I do want to introduce Dr. John Hart, leads the communication department here at HPU. We are here at Aloha Tower where the campus is. Dr. Hart, I understand you have a few words. Mahalo and welcome to the HPU historic Aloha Tower Marketplace campus. If you've not had a chance to visit lately, I hope you have a chance to walk around and see what we've done. We're so happy to co-sponsor this event. Without further ado, here is Civil Beat editor and lead guitarist, Chad Blair. <laughs> Thank you. You're a musician too, I'll ask you about that later. Um, before we get to our format with uh, Rep Depola, let me go ahead and give you uh, the standard drill here. Uh, Honolulu Civil Beat is a nonprofit news organization dedicated to cultivating an informed body of citizens trying to make Hawaii and Honolulu a better place to live. Uh, as you know, this is now the fifth and final in our series on the gubernatorial race. The primary is August 11th. And uh, thanks again to HPU for helping us out here. We are live streamed right now. It is live. Uh, it will be archived later on YouTube and Facebook. It's exactly one hour in length. We will end at 7 p.m. And the way it's going to work is um, basically it's you and me back and forth for about 40 minutes, maybe here or there. And then we've actually collected some questions online from our readers beforehand. And then we are going to allow people in the audience the opportunity to ask questions for the last 15 minutes. Um, if you turn around, you'll see Mari Cheng in the Civil Beach shirt. You can't miss her. She has little note cards. If you do have a question at any time, uh, just ask her. She's going to write them down rather than have you go to the mic. It just works easier. And so look for her. I, a lot of Reptopolis supporters are here tonight. That's okay. No softballs, guys. All right. <laughs> ask meaningful deep yes. questions I'm sure you will uh, without further ado are you, are you ready to go yes let's do it oh uh, by the way yeah cell phones off and, and please uh, I know you want to cheer now and then but try and keep it to a minimum thank you very much okay Reptopola uh, the first questions uh, five or six of them actually come from our readers and I, you're gonna love this first one I've rarely heard about you who are you and why do you want to be governor Thank you. Well, should I face you face out here? Yeah, what should she do? Face the camera. Face the camera. Yes, let's do that. Um, my name is Andrea Chipola. I'm a State House representative for District 43. So my area starts in Eva and it ends in Ma'ili. I've been a State House legislator for four years right. now. And prior to that, I was a professor at Leeward Community College. I taught voice and choir, <laughs> not <laughs> politics. And it was actually the, the love of my life. I got two of my degrees in music education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, as well as Brigham Young University. I am a Kamehameha Schools graduate, right. song contest director, and I actually was raised in Hawaii Kai, born in Kahuku. So that's a little bit about me and the reason why I'm running for governor. I deeply feel the need to serve. I actually lived in Venezuela for over a year and I learned how to serve people from other countries and I also learned the fact that here in America we have many freedoms. Here in this country, in the state, we have lots of things that allow us to participate. So upon returning back to America, I wanted to contribute. Okay. So that's why I d initially decided to run for office and later when I became a state house representative, I saw the systemic issues going on in the state and I really wanted to make a bigger impact and learn how to serve not just my community but how that service could stem throughout the whole entire state and really get at the root of some of our okay. biggest issues. Great. You know, I think in many ways what this question is getting to <clears throat> is that you're not well known to a lot of people. As you said, you've only been in office right. for a while, although you are the highest ranking elected official in your party. You are the minority leader in the House of Representatives. You're running against uh, one Republican, John Carroll, who's fairly well known. He's been around a long time, run a lot. Ray LaRue, the third candidate, very unknown. But why do you think you are not better known, at least to this reader and others? Um, is, have you just not been on the scene enough? 
Well, I think for those who are plugged into the political scene, you know, they're used to maybe the 12, 25 year length to really get to know somebody mm. who's in public service. For me, I've been very active on social media, active in my community, active in different causes. So I do believe for those who have actually only been plugged into one channel, it's something totally new for them. So I would invite people who kind of don't know what's going on because we have been very transparent about sharing videos about where I am, sharing videos about my stances, and as well doing live videos so people can ask me questions. Like this one. More questions. Um, where and when did you actually make the decision to run for governor? I would say it was in Kohala. Um, I was on the Big Island. I was actually in a community meeting where they asked me for help to make a community action plan about drug abuse. They felt like it was pervasive throughout their community. They wanted to see somebody that could help them put together a strategy so that they could have hope. I mean, I literally walked into the room and there was hundreds of people there just feeling hopeless, feeling like the drugs had taken over, that their own family members were strung out, that it was going in all the way into the high school. And so when I stood in that meeting and I really asked the people, I said, do you feel like there's a power over you from the government that you can't control? Everyone said, yeah. And I said, that's not true. Hmm. No, nobody has a power over you. The only power that people have over you is the power you choose to give to them. So you need to get active. You need to remind your public officials they work for you. You need to start making phone calls, make a plan, rise up. You know, get, get your community together and say, this is what Kohala is, this is how we want to protect it, preserve it for future generations. And in that meeting, it was just roaring. I mean, the people were so excited that somebody had told them that they could be empowered. And I remember walking out of that meeting and having this distinct impression that you can help more people prepare yourself now. And I kept thinking like, that's always been something in, rooted inside of me is that I've always wanted to serve people. I never th thought in this realm, hmm. but if it does mean that I can be of help and service to other people, then I will lay aside things that are important to me and do what's best okay. for the community. Okay, interesting. It was concerns about drugs in, in the Kohala area on the Big Island. And as you said, your audience got excited when you said, it's really you're the power that's yeah. involved here. Let me ask you this. You mentioned po politicians are in office a long time. Certainly we have more than our fair share here oh. in Hawaii. Often what happens, and it's not the case with everyone, but Often what will happen, I've seen it as a, as a journalist, that you get an office and pretty soon you start thinking your opinions are more important than the people that put you yes. in that office. And the thing that I hear quite a lot from constituents is they don't return my calls, they don't listen to me. How are you going to prevent that from happening should you get in the governor's office? Well, I don't know if a lot of people know, but the governor has, you know, between 44 and 46 full-time paid staff. And in that office, they actually have certain people that are over constituent concerns for each area of the state. I think in my office, we have, I have two, you know, if you're the leader, you get one extra full-time person, but usually only have one full-time person. With two people, we were able to do so much for our community and help many other communities resolve some of their constituent concerns when they don't get responses from other offices or from the governor's office. So my idea really is to kind of take the same strategy and with more people, obviously you can cover more ground. So I'm excited to keep up this similar boots on the ground, mm. community oriented, town hall, rich kind of strategy so that their voices are what leads the direction of this state. So you want a direct pipeline between the, the outreach offices on all the, the major islands uh, as well you were promising town squares because that's another thing that happens oh, you yeah. get in the governor's office you're up on the fifth floor. Nobody sees you. Yeah and I sometimes you'll see occasionally they'll go to Maui it's usually around election time or they'll go to the big island they'll go to Kauai, Molokai, Lanai if they're lucky. Well you if you get to be governor try and make a concerted effort to frequently visit the neighbor islands because I'm sure you heard in Kohala, we're very Oahu-centric here on this island. Yes. So to date, I've been a legislator for four years. I've held 41 town halls. So we have four quarterly town halls, and I hold it in three different areas, and I rotate it so people know that it can be in their town, down their street, at their community center. So I'm excited to do this because, really, I don't understand how anyone could lead this state without community input. Because some of the deepest issues that we have, you're gonna have to get to know community experts who are even more knowledgeable than maybe somebody with a degree because of that historical knowledge. I mean, we're talking about DLNR, we're talking about Department of Education. You gotta start to study this history of what's been going on and you can't do that. I always say, you can't know unless you go. <laughs> so you need to go and then you might know what's going on. Okay, more from our readers and then we'll get to the civil B questions. <laughs> Why are you a Republican? 
Hmm. <laughs> well, I did allude to the fact that I went to Venezuela for over a year, right. but when I got back, I was very anti-government. <laughs> I was very... Was this, uh, if I looked at your bio correctly, 0405, so was this Hugo Chavez? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes, he was the president. And so during that time, you know, for people who know, especially for Hispanics, it was such a huge movement that happened not just one year. It was decades of watching this turning point from becoming so dependent on the government. So when I got back, you know, my first thought is, we need to empower our communities. We need to find strategies that we don't become dependent on things that are not for sure. They became dependent on a government that cracked and basically said, okay, now we don't have jobs, now we don't have food, good luck, you know. And that's certainly the case now under his successor, there's practically a revolution Maduro. going, well, yeah. it's really a dictatorship right. in many ways. But let me get back to that question. What is it about the Republican Party that attracts you? I, and the reason I'm bringing this up, and I'm following on the reader's question is, um, this is a democratic controlled state, I don't have to tell you that. Why choose the Republican Party? So with my story about that, my whole initiative was that I wanted smaller government. I wanted okay. less government in our lives. The less that they can do, the better. The more we can empower ourselves and become community centric, the more our people will be liberated because then the government is there to protect you. It is not there to run your life, to dictate your choices, but yet when we have governments that expand at an exponential rate, that's what you get. You sound a little like Ronald Reagan, I, I'm gonna paraphrase, but his famous line among others is, the worst words you can hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So, <laughs> but you're echoing the, the long standing platform of the Republican Party, nationally, certainly locally, that a smaller government is better. Right, let's support local business, keep local dollars here. If we keep, can't keep our conversations centered on our people, we've lost the point of what we're doing. So I need us to keep those conversations centered, community centric, so that every time they, you know, we speak, we're speaking from a perspective that makes a difference. People always say, I would go to the Capitol, but I don't understand what anyone's saying. <laughs> you know, like, what are they talking about? Yeah. So we need to make things so that anybody can participate. And I always tell people, if I can do it, so can you. I have no law degree. I have a music degree. But it doesn't change the fact that our government was built for people to participate. Therefore, anybody should be able to do this if we're able to make it where it is participatory. And I think that some people are afraid that that's what we're not becoming, right? It's becoming more non-transparent. We don't know who's going, where is the hearings? Who had a hearing about what? What was that issue? What's a special session? All of these things and procedures that people are just like, you know what? I don't want I don't want to get involved. I, I just this is just bureaucracy. So we need to cut all of that out and just keep it about the people. Okay. Uh, another question from readers. Um, uh, why haven't you done a civil beat Q&A for this campaign? Oh, so I think that they emailed me and they said, "Oh, we forgot to email your your correct email address." I think they sent it to the Capitol. So, we'll get that done. There is still time. There is still time. <laughs> and just so you know, it's pretty extensive. So I imagine we'll, it is. We will be handing that in. Okay, another uh, reader question. Do you support the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea and I actually heard you talk about this as the Hilo forum not not long ago and you're a native Hawaiian uh, please tell us uh, your view on the TMT well my biggest issue is that people have not read through all the auditors report as you know the yeah. auditor regularly gives us directive on where we can fix things in the state but how many people read those and think, oh, maybe I should address those so that we can not have systemic issues. This is ongoing. You read the audit. Oh, yes. 1998, 2005, 2014, 2017. Audits. Audits, yeah. <laughs> so back in 1998, when it first started, the auditor came out and said, UH may not be able to handle this because there are all this negligence in different areas, but as you know, the auditor's report gives suggestions. It said, do X, do Y, do Z, and then maybe we'll see. We'll come around to the next auditor's report in 2005, it didn't get better. It said, we still have shown negligence in the management of the mountains. There needs to be an even balance between cultural, environmental, and ast astronomy aspects, and there's still not enough on the cultural and the environmental. We still don't know, are they protecting the environment up there? Are they giving enough cultural significance to the places of importance so then comes out the next auditor's report in 2014 and even more so it said now we're at a breaking point because i don't know if you know but around that time is when all the protests were happening they were saying there's Excuse the protectors yes so a lot of some the, were saying their their main mission is to protect what they consider to be a sacred mountain exactly and i think that during that time even more so the auditor was trying to emphasize the fact that we have come to this point for a reason we haven't managed the mountain well there is no administrative rules. Therefore, when you go up there, what are the rules that we're abiding by? Nobody knows. The main leaseholder is DLNR. The sub-leaseholder is UH. 
And then from UH, they give out the leases to the strand. But if UH has no rules, then what are they supposed to enforce? So do care officers go up to the mountain. They try to like sort out all the mess. But what are they sorting out? What, are, what, what rules are we upholding? Then Hawaii Island police sends their guys over there. And then they're standing up there like, hey, wh what are we enforcing over here? No one knows because they never had administrative rules. And so if you look through the auditor's report, it gives you this like blockchain of all the steps you need to do to make administrative rules. And they're like on step five okay. of like 14. Uh, just to follow up on this, uh, the issue is pending before the, the high court, having gone through the contested case and, and, and so forth. And there's the sublease issue. And, and, and I don't want to get into too much of the details. But on a macro level, uh, and your point about the audits not being followed is well taken. But on a macro level, do you like the idea of Mount Kea being used for astronomical research? Do you think, by extension, there could be a balance between Native Hawaiian gathering rights and, and protecting the environment along with this scientific adventure? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, science and I think embracing it on the astronomy point is definitely something many Hawaiians want to see. But Mauna Kea and its management is the root. And then we talk about astronomy because if the management plan is still unclear, kind of like what you said about right. what is the balance, then we forever will be in the same discussion of, is there enough of a balance? Because they were supposed to make a cultural center. Oh, did they make it? No. They were supposed to have a cultural practitioner. Oh, did that happen? Sort of. So all of these, oh, it's gonna be a three-legged stool. If you've ever read the comprehensive management plan, that's what they say. It's a three-legged stool where it's equally astronomy, culture, and environment. Has that three-legged stool? It's a one-legged stool. Yeah, so, so that's, okay. that, that's the gist right. of what's happening. Um, you mentioned uh, being a Kamehameha Schools graduate. You're also uh, of Samoan ancestry. Uh, but concerning Native Hawaiians, are you satisfied with the stat status of Native Hawaiians? As you, we all know, uh, they are disproportionately overrepresented in our prisons and jails. Uh, their health concerns are higher than many other groups here. I could name a number of other things like that. but. What what would you do? You would be a Native Hawaiian governor. We have only had one. You know, first off, DHHL. <laughs> we cannot downplay the fact that Hawaiian we, homelands. Yeah, we have a, a department that's specifically over housing Hawaiians. How many new houses did we get last year? None. Hmm. So they actually put no houses. Well, they might have did some renovation. Okay. They did some turn. You know, turn. Oh, we we renovated this. We got new houses that they they did mainly leases last okay. year so granted uh there's some question there the bigger issue is we've decided that we're going to make a list and then on that list we're going to tell people that one day they have a house why are we making a list if we don't intend to make houses? and this list has a very long it's a long list and it's taken years right so, so what would you do? I mean, how could, if other governors haven't been able to move the dial, I know under uh, Linda Lingle and Mike Akane running DHHL, there was some progress. Um, I can't really tell you exactly what's going on under Governor Ige. There hasn't been some frustration about funding uh, from the state, but uh, what would you do? What would be your, I guess, if you got an office, your first step, other than appointing a new director, perhaps? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that it has to be where we really see the vision clearly. For those of you who don't know, the Native Hawaiian Homes Act is what dictates what the office is supposed to do. Uh, the, but that's territorial, right? You're talking about the back in the 1920s from Congress? or Yes. Okay. So Prince Kuhio passed it through Congress as a Republican congressman, and it basically dictates what the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is supposed to be executing. It didn't just talk about homes. It talked about preserving the wellness of the Hawaiian people. So that means that it didn't just say build a bunch of homes it said provide them places to grow provide them the wherewith so that they can grow it the agricultural crops the proper irrigation so that they can actually thrive not survive and so if we're not helping Native Hawaiians thrive and we're giving out an ag lot but hey good luck go find a tractor go see where you can get water from we have lots in Molokai that have house Ag land. How many people use both? Very few. We have lots of lots in North Island, um, of Hawaii Island. No infrastructure. Yeah. Here's a lot. Good luck. Put in everything yourself. How, how, how is that exactly fulfilling the vision? That's going to cost money, infrastructure. Right. But again, it beyond goes back. Beyond DHHL's current budget. It goes back to, do we have a vision? Because if our vision is to help Native Hawaiians thrive, then we need to determine this is how much we can do, and then let's do what we can. Not promise all these things and then oh we're just going to do this okay much this just year. one final question as you know being in the legislature there are lawmakers that have felt uh, a lot of reservations about giving more money to dhhl because they're not seeing the progress and if oh, you're governor yeah. you're going to have to be able to convince them 
Because you're saying infrastructure is key here. To oh, really yeah. Okay. And I'm going to have to prove that, right? Because we can't get more funding if we're not putting out. So as a department, we're going to have to clean it out. We're going to have to become more efficient. We're going to have to spend down federal dollars instead of give it back. Mm. We're going to have to make sure that everything that we need from the federal government, we ask for it. People always say, the administration administration's cutting Native Hawaiian money. Well, who's going to D.C. and fighting for it? Because that's what we should be doing, is saying, this is how much our budget is. Please don't cut these areas, because this is how we're spending it. This is the outcome of it. This is the productivity of it. But we can't even quantify that now. We need to quantify that, prove it to the legislature, prove it to Congress, and say, boom, okay. we're housing Hawaiians. Help that's, us out. That's ambitious. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to uh, civil beat questions. Um, what executive experience do you have? Well, you know, I think for me, definitely running different operations as a choir teacher, being over different things for the University of Hawaii system, working with multiple schools throughout the Leeward area. So when I did, you know, teach there, it wasn't just, oh, teach a few classes, go home. I actually ran regular choral festivals. I actually operated with many of the public schools to organize and help to build their programs. And that's something you do as a music teacher all the time because you want to build in a pipeline, right? You can't succeed at the University of Hawaii system if you don't have kids coming into your program so you really have to start to branch out work with every school see what you can do organize festivals organize fairs fundraise money no, it sounds very uniforms. impressive uh, this is the first time I'm hearing someone saying being a music teacher is a good preparation for being a governor you're running a very large bureaucracy sure. uh, a huge budget with competing forces inside yeah, you know, and when I was at um, Brigham Young University, equally, when I was the student body vice president, you know, our budget was $2 million. I was over 12 different departments, and granted I was young, granted that it, it's only 33,000 students, so it's not huge, but it's, it's big enough where at the age of... 20, I was able to understand that I had to work with the governor of Utah as well as schools throughout the, uh, the state so that we could make sure to do what we needed to for the students and it was eye-opening. I was the vice president, I was over 12 executive directors and we were over 600 volunteers. So we had to manage different programs, balance the budget, make sure to prove things to the schools. So it was my first time kind of understanding that and of course once I moved out of the country and I was able to live there for over a year even more so I started to see how big organizations governmental ones can influence entire trains of thought. So. Uh, did you serve on House Finance? Yes, I did. So you've, you've looked at the budget. You've seen it up, up close and yes, personal. It's, it really is the core of everything that happens there. Uh, can it be... Um can it be understood to the average taxpayer? There's a mystery on the part of a lot of people that, including journalists, on how that thing gets put together and a desire for more transparency on how CIP gets allocated, capital improvement projects, how decisions get made to give money to this and not to that. Is that something that you as governor might pledge toward more transparency about where our dollars are going? In fact, I think it's something that your um, minority caucus has pushed for. You know, when Sam Sloan was in the Senate, we actually made the open budget website. That's right. He, Do you Remember that? Consistently put out, of course, there's no more Republican, but he, in fact, did introduce a very transparent budget. Uh, of course, it was not used by, that I know of, by the administrations no. on the Democrat side. And they put a lot of effort into it. Basically, what it was is that anybody could go in and then put in if they wanted to see what money got spent right. here and there. I mean, having an open budget system and letting the people of Hawaii know where the money is going, that's, that's automatic. I mean, if they were able to have a, a login to see the account, that would even be more, you know, more transparent. Well, how would you do that? Because you're, in all likelihood, if you do get elected, you're going to stay with a Republican, excuse me, a Democratic-controlled House and Senate, meaning a wham and, and finance uh, chairs. Uh, and I'm not sure how you would change that, how they would go along with your idea to implement that system. Well, you know, if we're talking about just the efficiency and effectivity of a department, you don't need to necessarily pass law to do that. You could put that up on your own. Yes. I mean, because it's your department. You've got to fix different things within it, make it more efficient, figure out how we can budget this better. Now, if you're talking about changing a law, then yes. You have to go to legislature, say, here, we are sure. implementing something new. Does anyone need to pass a law to have an open budget system? No. Okay. Does anyone need to ask the legislature for permission to become more effective in each of the departments and maybe publicize some of the expenditures? No. Okay. Uh, speaking of legislation, uh, and clarify, correct me if I'm wrong on this, your House Minority Package, I guess this would have been 2017, 2018, because it's biennial. Uh, 22 bills is by my count. None passed. Is that a reflection on your your leadership or your lack of leadership? Yes, I know the chamber is controlled by Democrats, but checking the, the legislation today, none of them passed. 
So for the caucus package, yes, that's true. And I think anything with the word Republican on it, yeah. <laughs> so I think whenever we put together the caucus package, our intent, of course, is to make sure people know where we're thinking, what our policies would be, what we're fighting right. for. Have some of those similar bills been passed by Democrats this session? Oh, yes. <laughs> so the concepts. I, I am going to actually list some of the bills. Is there one in particular you can think of that the Democrats said, hey, that's not a bad idea and, and pushed forward? Well, I mean, we, we introduced uh, bills regarding the EITC. <laughs> the in earned income earned tax income credit. Tax Did that credit? pass? Uh, yeah. Okay. It was two years. That was part year. of your platform, actually. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, it's definitely stuff where we put it out there. We see what sticks. People take it. They run with it. At the end of the day, people always say, you know, you can get more done when it doesn't matter who gets mm. the credit. But Did they invite you to the bill signing? Uh, no. Okay, all right. Well, actually, <laughs> let me go along those same lines. I mean, I think if you describe your package, and by extension, I'm wondering whether you're going to push this as governor, it's about money. Uh, repeal the estate tax or death tax. Exempt the general excise tax from food and... Yes. Medical medicine. services. Establish its medical services, it says. I believe there um, is an exemption already for some medications, is my understanding from my learned colleagues, George Yurton. Uh, reduce the vehicle weight tax and the registration fee, which seems to go up all the time. People, when you, the state needs money, they leap to that. And then you mentioned the EITC, which did pass. Uh, better track the capital improvement money. Are those ideas that you would push forth in your own? Uh, package of bills, they have to be introduced by the, the House and Senate leadership, but would that form a core of what you would do as governor? Oh, we need to cut taxes. We absolutely have to address the cost of living here. People like to talk about it peripherally, but really the cost of living is directly impacted by the amount of taxes that we put on the people. So as you know, this year we actually talked about the child tax credit. Mm -hmm. We have it on the federal level, we don't have it on the state level. So there's various things that really, it's not just Republicans, many people are talking about How this. does that work, the child tax credit? Well, you can claim it on the federal level, but it's not a, a state A tax. deduction based on? How many kids you have, yes. what ages they are, I actually claim it for the federal, okay. but on the state side we don't have it. It would be you know, something that we could partner it with. The state is also in control of income tax. The state is also in control of the general excise tax. The state is also in control of the corporate tax. The state is also in control of regulation, so there's different things that we could move around to kind of start to alleviate that burden. Uh, by reducing the flow of income, that's uh, less revenue for the general fund. How are you going to make up the difference to continue funding unfunded liabilities, uh, right. existing programs, and so forth? Where are you going to make up the revenue? I have some great ideas. Oh, let's such hear, as, let's let's hear <laughs> one or two. And by the way, we are at the halfway point. Just want to every, let everybody know, and I wanted to remind um, everyone that Mariko, who is actually put on a jacket because it's a little cold in here, uh, has the little index cards in hand and a pen. And if you do want to ask a question for the mm -hmm. rep, which will start in about 15 minutes, please raise your hand and she'll come over. There's one right now. Thank you, Rep Tapola. All right, you're talking about ideas to raise revenue. Let's cut waste. Ah. Uh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about vacant buildings. Let's talk about maybe warehouses that exist. We won't say where, but. Uh, state. Uh, oh, yes, okay. state run buildings empty. Let's talk about hangars that are empty at the airport. Let's talk about schools that have been abandoned because there's no school there anymore. Let's talk about contracts that have been given out that really aren't being performing the work anymore. Let's talk about special funds that actually don't serve their purposes anymore, but still have pockets of millions of dollars. And granted, it's just a million here too. That all adds up. It all adds up when we're not be keeping careful track of where all the money's in the Do state. Do you have a going. ballpark uh, of what that might add up to? Because we're talking about a budget that's in uh, double figures in the billions of dollars. Uh, right, right. I mean, for each of the departments, they actually have a number. So the auditor has audited each department. I believe for one of the departments, they had 86 special funds. The judiciary has special funds. DHHL, Department of Health has. And for various ones of them, the auditor suggests, okay, cut this one out. This one's been dormant. This one doesn't serve its purpose. So slowly on the Finance Committee, we've been trying to address these, shut them down. I've heard Sylvia Luke uh, say just as much, a concern about special funds. Is this an area where you might have some common ground? Oh, definitely with the other party there's been lots of stuff that you know under her with the finance committee we've we've agreed on her me and Jean Ward are like yes let's do that yes let's talk about the um, what is it called tax modernization system. yes the governor was sitting right in your chair last night saying things are going well with that plan although Colleen Hanabusa who also sat in that chair said no things are not going with that plan there's it, been problems with the contractor and so forth it is not going good I mean and we specifically asked the Department of Taxation like where are we at with this and 
why are we continuing to spend millions of dollars in no outcome? And as you know, there already was a report from the auditors Correct. saying what all the problems were. So I'm not saying that it's going to be like, boom, all of it's done. Sure. But how many of these different things have we left unaddressed? I have yet to know. On the finance committee, I was kind of blown away. I was like, whoa, this is how many things that are going, you know, that we're expending in departments and then not really tracking that there's an outcome for this million dollar project, okay. that multi-billion dollar project. Related to revenue growth, what about another uh, industry that might generate, uh, other than, uh, you know, tourism and the, the military sector, there are some others. We've, we've tried diversified ag. It does mm -hmm. add some to our, our needs, but there is no other third real main industry. There has been talk about tech and so forth. What do you envision in terms of another industry to help Hawaii? You know, I always talk about agriculture, and I know you brought up diversified ag, and I think in my mind, I'm thinking of many different ways, and we have agriculture land that's divided in two, ag land, crop land, two different, right. right? When I was in Maui, people are still asking, what's going on with industrial hemp? How come the state passed it? We, we don't see anything coming up. Long Your story, colleague, Cynthia Thielen, has uh, been fighting for industrialized hemp forever. She would be so happy to see it up, get up off the ground. What I'm trying to bring up is that that whole land is still vacant, and people are very concerned that they don't want to just turn into more development. I mean, what if you want to see more ag products come up, but those ag businesses need help. Any company that's going to st step their foot into something new is going to need some type of, you know, in initial money to get up there, which the state offers agribusiness development corporation money. They st offer grants. Tax credits and tax so forth. Tax credits. But I think if we really want to invest in a, a different industry, we got to invest in it. I mean, we put less than 1% into the Department of Agriculture. So if we wanted to diversify in our economy and create agriculture, we'd have to invest in it. So it's not going to just happen. Where would you take that money from to give more to the DOA? Well, there's enough departments, I think, that definitely have shown that they have extreme amount of vacancies. And as you know, on the Finance Committee, that's what we talk about. Why are these uh, positions vacant? How long have they been vacant? Oh, we can't find qualified people. Oh, we can't fill that one. So we're really going to have to talk with the departments and figure out, okay, if you've been operating for 17 years without these positions, what could we then do to make sure that other departments that have people ready, that have programs ready, instead of putting people in and then thinking, all right, what do we do with them now? What should okay. we do? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to ask you this question uh, because I also asked it of Ray LaRue. And, and John Carroll, and it's one that's always been on my mind. Uh, even though there's politics nationally, everything's split, one thing you can say for sure is the Republican Party controls uh, the House, the Senate, the White House, really the Supreme Court appointments, uh, and a majority of the state legislatures and governorships. Why hasn't that uh, popularity of your party caught on here? And what would you do if you become the leader of your party? Um, I think for each of those entities you just brought up, although people would like to see some big group say, it's cool to be this now, the reality is is that the people who run their local parties are the elected officials. Meaning that we would need to have leaders within these communities that would say, this is a re what a Republican looks like, this is what they do, this is how they talk. I mean, I've had people say, I've never met one before. <laughs> like, uh, who are these people? I said, you know, I am one. A third of the electorate uh, typically votes for the Republican, uh, for governor, uh, voted for President Trump here in Hawaii. There are a lot of Republicans in this state. How come they haven't been able to get over, with some exceptions, Linda Lingle, a Charles DeJou, a Hiram Fong, a few people in the legislature? You know, it, it's so much more multifaceted than people think. You know, they think, okay, we're going to get Linda in, in there and then we'll get all these more legislators. Like, that doesn't happen automatically. That takes years of seating and fielding candidates and actually mentoring them and telling them how to get involved. This is what you would, I mean, you applied to be your party chair. You lost yeah. to Charlene Ostroff, but this is something you would take on as leader of your party. Well, we would have to work hand in hand. Sure. And she and I have been working great together. You know, her being Filipino, being a local girl, I feel like finding we're starting to see that we need to tap into lots of different ethnicities, lots of different communities where people do resonate with what we talk about, but we just don't go there. Hmm. I mean, when's the last time, you know, we did these these type of events in Y&I, but right. now we can, because now I'm the elected official, so we can hold events and talk about homelessness and what my stance is on it versus other people's and how we can build that into what the party platform is. So I believe that it does actually, it's empowered by the people who hold office. Okay. Still the perception out there, the stereotype that Republicans in Hawaii look like me? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <It's enough. laughs> You're cute. <laughs> All right, a total fun one. Are you ready? Um, you play the piano. Uh, when you're stressed out, I, I have to ask this because I just I, I'm curious always as to how politicians handle things. What do you play? What kind of songs? Is it Beethoven? Is it oh, Alicia Keys? Oh, total softball here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Alicia Keys, but uh, I play classical. Ah, my favorite is Debussy. Really, Claude Debussy. I love Claire de Lune. I love to play oh. that song. I love all of the arabesque, like everything that you know Debussy writes. I love playing that music. <laughs> and, and here's another fun one. You're on the cover of Lady Pacifica uh, for Samoan American audience, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, you're a fan of Stephen Covey's. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I've seen his name. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, I actually... This is the Oprah Winfrey part of the interview, <laughs> by the way. I actually carry that book in my bag. I have it in my car. Um, my whole thing is that, you know, you learn about leadership and management throughout your life, but every time you step into a new realm, those principles mean something different to you. You know how many times I've read that book? Give me one of the principles. I, I haven't read it in a long time, but if you don't... Not Begin to put with you the, on the end spot. in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Okay, you're running for governor. Tell me how you're going to begin with the end in mind. I guess this is sort of a, what do you want to look like for you? years after a, your first term. Is well, that a fair? Yeah, I mean, I think that. I'm putting on the spot a little bit. I agree, envisioning but, what, you know, where okay. you want to be. But what I work with with my campaign team is we go from November 6th and work backwards. So mm -hmm. like, what is it going to feel like on November 6th? What am I going to, where am I going to be? What people are going to be there? Because every step that you take has to lead up to your end goal. So if you look down and you're constantly moving ahead like this without realizing where you're oh, going, when you look up, you could be like, oh, I was supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, because you didn't begin with the end in mind. And so beginning with the end in mind has everything to do with envisioning your goal and then tracing your steps. And every time you can, re-evaluating those steps and making sure you're still going towards the same end goal. Okay. A couple more questions, then we're going to uh, readers' questions. You attended BYU, uh, the, the uh, Latter-day Saints uh, Church. You are active in Christian groups as well. How would you, as, as the leader of the state, balance religion and government? Well, as a public official, you know, your job is really to be the voice of the people. So that really takes you becoming very used to being a microphone. A microphone. <laughs> Meaning that you amplify the voice. A megaphone? Yeah, it could be a, a megaphone, microphone, megaphone. A microphone. Sure. Basically, you become the conduit by which people speak through, right? So I represent YNI. So I go to legislature. I have to hold town halls so that I can better represent their voice to everybody else. This is what my community thinks is, so as the governor of the state, it's the same reason why I would hold town halls, right? Is that I become the voice of what the people need and what they want. Now, my personal beliefs, where does that come in? That helps me to conduct myself, meaning that people will know that I'm a person of integrity, that I'm a person that you know decides that I'm gonna always say something and do it. So those type of characteristics in me are what people can expect in my community and know that that's who I'm gonna be. However, okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that I push my beliefs over other people. Okay, because uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, just very recently that we, religion is being lost. The, 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 those values that are important are not necessarily being respected uh, by the U.S. government, by the state government. And of course here locally there was a huge outpouring of a lot of religious groups for the same-sex marriage issue, the mm -hmm. medical aid in dying. Uh, it, Correct me if I'm wrong, you opposed both, is that right? Yes. Well, I, I actually wasn't in the legislature when SB1 went through. Thank you very much, but for, for the uh, medical aid in dying, and is it fair to say that for religious reasons was one of the primary reasons to oppose this? The complaint, and I'm, this is not my complaint, but coming from many people, including some Democrats, that it's gone too far in the other way, uh, that the First Amendment is not recognizing that these beliefs and values are important and that somehow we have to accommodate them more. Well, in, during the session, when we discussed medical aid and dying, I actually did stand up on the floor and propose amendments. And all of the amendments that I proposed were in regards to the law. And so the law and the way that it was written, one of my biggest concerns was giving out that quantity of medication with no type of way to 
receive it back. Right now, you can't return back that medication to any pharmacy. We have no procedure that you do that. And of course, many of the advocates from Oregon said, lots of people apply for medical aid and dying, never use it. Well, the quantity of pills that's out there when people don't use it was of concern to me because we have an opioid crisis. Okay. So we're talking about different things. Yeah, but it's drugs. And maybe I've been inarticulate in bringing up the religion view, but that is something that has been raised and arguably helped put uh, Donald Trump into office, the concern that uh, we're not giving enough respect to organized religion. Well, and I say that there's a way to do both, right? Is is recognize that people have their right to be religious, but at the same time, as a legislator, my job is to understand if we are passing public policy that's going to be safe for the public. Okay. So all of my comments during those uh, hearings and my comments on the floor as well as my amendments all went back to what parts of this law are not is the public not ready for? Okay. What pop parts of this law is the medical community saying that we're not ready for? And then I bring those concerns forward. And, and they ended up not adopting any of them. The bill was pretty much a done right, deal going right. forward. Right, right. Okay. Uh, homelessness, uh, why and I uh, harbor the, the homeless camp, uh, predominantly Native Hawaiians, but there's others out there. Where do you stand on that? There was an effort, or at least perceived effort, for the government uh, uh, under EGA to, to tear that down, and then they held off on that. Others have pointed to to that as a model, then maybe, in fact, that is the way to go. We are now looking at $30 million for Ohana zones, safe zones. If you're governor, that would be on your, your agenda. What's your view on the Waianae Harbor, the homeless camp that's out there? Well, I'm very close with Auntie Twinkles. Sure. I actually ho help at the harbor a lot, and I was able to... The mayor, of the, the unofficial <laughs> mayor of the camp. Yeah, 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 and I was able to actually assist them to make some steps forward to become a nonprofit because they wanted to start to empower themselves to maybe... They want to become grants. a nonprofit. That's a fascinating idea. Is that is that viable? Yeah. Oh, they've already become one. So the, oh, the thanks for correcting me. Yeah. The idea, though, is that they would actually organize to be able to apply for grants. Apply oh, I for see. my, you know, message to them because they actually reached out to me and asked me to help. And I, I'm not, you know, that's not my district, but I, I asked them, what is it that you guys are searching for? They said, we just don't want to be bothered. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be able to live in this communal setting and not be harassed by the state or the public. You know, and obviously this whole verbal agreement to allow them to stay happened almost 12 years ago okay. when, you know, the Boat Harbor Master said, okay, if you guys take care of this, you can stay here. Well, now it's come to the point where people are like, okay, this is not what we want for the community, but how do we empower a group of people to actually get on their feet, say, we work well together, how do we get a piece of land? How do we get, you know, moving forward with housing that we think could fit for our community. So I believe for me, the whole issue, and actually Civil Beat covered this article very well when we had the neighborhood board. My issue is that if you're going to come out and oppose the boat harbor, which the governor's team was kind of on both sides, right. if you're gonna say something, then do it. Yeah. But don't say something and then the next day say, oh, I'm not gonna do that, and then come back and say, oh, I am gonna do that. <laughs> oh, wait, I am gonna, no, we're not gonna sweep you. Like, look, just stick to what you said and do it. So if you think that you know the place needs to be cleared out, then where's the path for it? Let's figure it out, okay. you know? Let's figure it out together. But then if you're gonna come back and say, oh, never mind, we're not gonna do it, that just, Everything about it, I think, for me, was just the, the ambiguity in what the state wants. It is a state piece of land. So the state has essential control and you know can dictate what they want to happen. What do they want? I don't know. They constantly sit down with me and tell me, what should we do? <laughs> Speaking of your district, uh, Maili is part of it, is correct? Yes, it yeah. is. Okay. Uh, you're, uh, and correct me if, help me pronounce the name, I apologize, but is it Sai Timoteo? Is yes, that correct? Yes, that's her name. Uh, just in the newspaper today on Civil Beat, running to succeed you. She, I believe she works in your office, or is she no longer part of uh, your she office? She never worked at the Capitol. Never worked at the Capitol, but you guys know each other. I believe you've endorsed her to to take your position because you're vacating the seat, but she's now ineligible to run because she was born in American Samoa, so she's not a U.S. citizen. There's now no Republican running for a seat that's held by a Republican. Would you weigh in on this? Of course. Um, let's clarify some, some facts there. She's not ineligible. So what had happened was the Attorney General decided to give a letter saying that they were questioning uh. her candidacy. Now. If you look at the Office of Elections, it actually says that if you want to challenge somebody's candidacy, you need to turn in that paperwork in June. So those deadlines for you to withdraw 
or to object to somebody's candidacy, all those timelines are actually in state statute and they've passed. Because can you imagine if people object all the way up into the election? The state of Hawaii made it that way so that they don't have to pay costly prices to redo elections, redo ballots. And that's why people, even who have passed away, their names are still on the that's ballot correct. all the way to the general. So that's number one. Okay. Number two is that when we talk about what happens next, there's two things, is that just solely, which is a federal way of determining citizenship, states that anyone born on U.S. soil is a citizen. And it says, including territories. John McCain ran for president, born in Panama, I think. Just solely. And so this, this whole concept is actually, lots of American Samoans are suing the federal government over it because they were born on American soil from a territory that American America is over, but yet they're not considered citizens. But this, this problem is actually still going on at the federal level where people are challenging the federal government, saying that you guys made the mistake. Prior to 1996, some of the forms had box U.S. citizen slash U.S. national. Okay. And people were getting I, this I don't want to dwell on somebody else's campaign, but are you saying that she still might be able to run? Or it's yes. Up in the, okay. So even if somebody decides to challenge, one, they have to challenge which, within the window of time, which the Office of Elections is now out of that window. Two, if you were going to challenge, it has to happen in circuit court. No one can write you a letter and say, oh, you're disqualified. You have to take that to court. And thirdly, if the federal government gets involved with this and there is actually some proven fact that you're born on American soil, therefore you're a citizen, done. Okay, thanks for your input on that. We're, this is just going by like this. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're in the last 50, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the last 15 minutes and I am gonna get to, uh, to the uh, questions that are before us and there's quite a few and I'm the person who has to filter. Uh, ooh, okay, here we go. Hawaii has the dubious reputation of being one of the worst places to do business. How will you help businesses, big and small, stay in business in Hawaii? And it is true, we do have that reputation. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but this is specific to business. Um, first off, you know, the state does control corporate tax, and it's very small here. It's a 4.3%, 4, 4 I think. And is it something that we could address? Yes. But a lot of businesses have asked for more than that, which is there are so many different regulations, and especially with permitting times, that just kills their revenue. Because one, they have you to- You hear this over and over again from businesses, right? right? Yeah. They're like, I would definitely open a business if I didn't have the X, Y, Z, A, B, C, <laughs> and then five years later, yeah. paid $20,000 for a building that I had no business in. And even the guys who are doing the medical marijuana dispensaries told me the same I thing. I mean, this is a county problem, too. I mean, you have state, you have county, right. but uh, that's going to be a priority to try and streamline the... I mean, because people are putting okay. millions of dollars into a business that they hope gets off the ground, but they have to comply with so many different things that by that time that comes up, you know, oh, I lost so much money, I don't want to do business okay. here. Another idea to help businesses. Um, I definitely think that what we need to do is figure out how to help them capture back the market. There is a group called Mana Up, and they actually are led by um, some venture capital capitalists that help them, helping local businesses tell their story as to why people should buy local products as opposed to the same product that's made somewhere else. It's, it's a very unique concept, however, many of these businesses struggle on how to capture that market when they're just trying to operate. They're trying to keep their doors open. They can't think about, how do I tell my story and make these videos and get out to the right market? So there are actual businesses, I would call them gap businesses, that help businesses to get out there and get that website they need, that app they need, that idea they need, and then market it to the right audience. Can you tell me what it is that you were able to drink earlier before you came on today? Is, oh. it, is, it, is it coffee? Is it soda? Oh, is a team. <laughs> <laughs> I want your secret. <laughs> Discuss some of your strengths and weaknesses. This is interesting. Your strengths and weaknesses as a leader that will affect you if you are governor. Maybe you can name one or two strengths and two areas where you may have to work on. Um, I would say a strength is that I'm very visionary. I'm able to cast a vision and then clearly see how to get it done. If you've ever done um, Strengths Finder Test, it's a book, 2.0, you should get it. <laughs> um, it actually tells you where your strengths are, and my number one strength is activator. Oh, you take like a test or something, like a mm -hmm. Q&A? Yeah, a, huh. and so I, my number one strength is activation, meaning that I'm the person that gets stuff done. Hmm. And so when I see a problem, usually I can navigate through all the problems and boom, get it done. Speaking of one of the things that you've done, uh, from particularly on the Waianae Coast, but elsewhere, you you actually are helping to get rid of abandoned vehicles. Oh. This is one of my pet peeves, because they're all over the state. Is that something, can you promise today? <laughs> 
Andrea Topola, that if you become governor, you will make clearing abandoned vehicles statewide a priority. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's like one of the easiest things I can do. Every time I think about it, I think going from two staff members to 44, let's clean. Let's clean the roads. I can't wait to do it. There's so many communities that would love to see those. Okay, cars. activation. Give me a weakness that it might be a problem for you. I am very headstrong. And I tend, you know, not to always take, you know, input as much as I should. So I definitely think weighing out millions of opinions and then ordering it. So headstrong meaning that most Polynesians are very, like, you know, respectful, listen to your elders. Hmm. I'm kind of more like, hey, we need to get this done. Let's do it right now. <laughs> Who are you? Sorry. What is your job? What is your role? Yeah, I don't need that. Let's go to the next thing. And so I'm, I'm sure I'm going to need to be a lot more, like, let's listen to what everyone has to say. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, uh, you will make many calls on your own. Of course, you have to work with the legislature and so forth. Yes. We're at the 10-minute mark, by the way, everybody. And I'll have to leave just like a minute at the end of, to say the closing remarks. All right, here's your chance to take a shot at David Ige. What do you see as the current administration's biggest failing, and how would you fix this problem if elected governor? Not having a vision. Colleen Hanabusa said the same thing. Four years of not really having a direction really equals no specific one goal. So you might be able to say, aircon, houses, but what was the main direction of where we were going for the Aren't past? Aren't those good things? Air conditioning the schools, more housing? Well, I think if I said aircon, if I was the governor, I would have called every single school. Oh. It would have been done the first year, telling you now. You would have air conditioned all of those schools. I'm just saying, I'm the person that people say, Andrew, you can't do this. And I'm like, yes, I can. Let's figure out how we're going to do it yesterday. All right. Okay. We're... Things to hold you to, should you get in. Aircon. <laughs> Aircon. <laughs> uh, discuss more about how you could get things done. And this says with a Democratic Congress, I assume it means a legislature. Uh, although, you know, who knows what's going to happen in Washington. But for now, it's a GOP. Um, do you get along? I guess another way to put this is, do you have good relations with the Democrats? Yes. In the House and Senate? Yes. I love working with my colleagues at the legislature. You know, the past four years, I've learned from so many of them. Many of them that have taken me aside, taught me how to learn, taught me how to read the law, how to debate, how to um, understand how to put amendments on the floor. Many people who know the legislature well know that the Democrats are not one group. <laughs> I know this very well. <laughs> so when people say, They're factions, right? Both gonna, in the House and yeah. the Senate. Yeah. How are you going to get along with the Democrats? In fact, the Republicans from time to time have actually been part of those factions in order to get leadership. Right. So. so we're talking about many different groups of Democrats that have different ideas, different thoughts, different struggles. Some of them haven't passed bills either. Some of them get true. denied their own CIP from their own That's party. True. So we have some similar struggles. All I'm going to do is look for legislators that want to get down and work for the people. Okay. What are your thoughts on plastic pollution? There's a big Ooh. plastic patch circulating out in the middle of the Pacific elsewhere, uh, and, and it washes up on our shores a lot. Of course, we're great polluters. What could you do there in terms of plastic pollution? Well, in general, I, I'm definitely somebody who preaches aloha aina or taking care of the land that we're in. We could talk about plastic as one thing, but we really should talk about trash because a lot of our communities have gone past the point with illegal dumping. And years ago, the state actually initiated a fee to all of the landfills. I know because I have landfills in my community. Yes, you do. In all of the landfills, they had to pay a fee for every pound of trash they collect. And that was supposed to go to the Department of Health to clean illegal dumping. Mm. Yeah, where is that? We're not sure. So we really need to make sure that when we talk about trash, yes, we don't want plastic in the ocean, but all of this affects our community because if we trash our community, then guess what happens? Everyone thinks it's okay. You leave a pile of tires in Waianae, you know what happens? People add to it. Hmm. Yeah, it becomes a spot yeah. just thrown out there. So we can't allow that to be the going, you know, I guess, agreement that, yes, we can leave our trash everywhere. Have you uh, ever cleaned up a coastline? Have you ever put on a pair of gloves oh, and gone out yes, there with I a bag? Oh, yes, I have. We just did our 14th cleanup. We hauled five tons of trash and 25 abandoned cars on the last Saturday. So. Okay, can you come to my neighborhood next week? <laughs> I'm in Manoa. <laughs> okay, both Ige and Hanabusa are against Nextera's Hawaiian electric acquisition. I uh, Certainly that is the case of David Ige. I, I can't quite remember where Colin Hanabusa stands on this. Uh, what is your position on this acquisition? It's been killed by the Public Utilities Commission, but did you have a view as to whether Hawaiian electric should have been purchased by the Florida company Nextera? Uh, I, I'm always for, you know, local management. I, people are very concerned when foreign companies or, you know, other outside state companies come in 
Who's going to manage it? How is that going to work? Secondly, I have actually a power plant in my district. Yes, you do. So You've got a landfill. You've got a power you plant. You name it, I have it. I have an airport, a harbor, a power plant, and landfills. So when I talk with the guys... Airport. Oh, Kalailoa, I that's guess. That's my yeah, dish. Yeah. yeah, I have a little city that I manage. So. <laughs> so, so any issue you're talking about, I know what's going on. All right. And I have Campbell Industrial. Yes, you have Campbell Industrial Park as well. Okay. Hawaii's school spending per pupil is high, but results are low. How will you improve schools for Keiki? Well, we, we need to streamline that department. Half the state budget, not producing enough. You know, I do know that... Is it that big of a... I know it's high. Is it, is it the biggest... It certainly has been the highest... Uh, appropriation for the DOE, although I think DHS has come up there as well. Yeah, it's about so, half. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you asked Ray LaRue the question, but he was actually... Oh, believe me, Ray talked a lot about education. Did he Former bring up, BOE employee. Did he bring up the amount of employees? Or DOE. Uh, no, why don't you do that? He, well, he, he mentioned in one of his speeches yeah. that it's 76,000. What? Well, so what does that suggest to you, 76,000 employees? Oh, uh, well, we have about 150,000 public school students. So I think at the end of the day, people just want to see more money go towards the students. So we need to make sure that we streamline those initiatives. If we need to break it up and put some of the DOE, uh, I guess, offices near the schools, maybe start, stop centralizing everything and decentralize it so that they can actually get immediate help, we ne definitely need to fund our schools adequately. Okay. Sadly, with the prepaid health care law, this is someone, uh, I'm assuming that means the state's prepaid. Prepaid health care law. Many employees are limited on hours to restrict them from receiving benefits. That's right. You have to work, what is it, 20 mm. hours to qualify. What can you do to help make health care more accessible here in Hawaii? Well, I think sitting down with our main health care providers and actually navigating with them through all of the hoops that they're currently trying to jump through to provide adequate health care. I was on the health committee for four years, and it was very eye-opening to see different types of legislation and how that ties the hands of Kaiser, HMSA, and we always think like, oh, they're raising these rates. But remember, a lot of these legislative bills that get passed that, you know, you have to this, you have to, all of it is going to incur more costs for our, our providers. And so it's something that I need to sit down with these providers and talk through, which is what at the state level is killing your companies that we can't bring down health care costs? And what at the state level can we do to be, provide more health care access? Uh, we're down near to the last couple of minutes. Uh, this is your time to convince me. Pretend that we're speed dating. Pretend that the audience out there is listening. Uh, what have we not talked about that you think is very important to stress about your candidacy? Um, that we need change. I definitely think that for me to be running at this age, at this time, during what we know is going on politically, there's a reason. We're having a women's movement year. Yes, we sure are. And we definitely are needing some change. In a Me Too movement era as well. Right. right? And we, we have a lot of Polynesians that have risen up into different prominent positions. So I feel like it's kind of all pointing towards a change that we need. And why else would I be 37 years old running for governor if I didn't feel so passionately that this had to happen now? Why wouldn't I run when I was 45, 50, if I didn't see that some of these systemic issues will compound to the point where I don't want to be a part of it anymore? Because if I continue to watch it compound over the next decade, two decades, after that, who's going to run and run the state? That's what my main concern is, is we have generations of children, local families here leaving, but yet we're not trying to address those systemic issues that basically are affecting the next generation. I want to see more local kids stay here. I want to make sure that my grandkids, great grandkids, everyone who's coming down in the future knows, hey, we gave it a good push while we had the energy and while we had the passion to do this, not, oh, we'll fix it next year. Oh, maybe in 20 years we'll get at that. Oh, one day we'll pay off the unfunded liability. All of that, for me, is discounting and taking away from future generations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can clap on that one. <laughs> Uh, State Representative Andrea Tapola, a Republican candidate for president in 2020. <laughs> I'm kidding. Candidate for governor in 2018 in the state of Hawaii. I wish you well with your campaign. Thank you. Um, I do want to also say thank you very much to Hawaii Pacific University. Dr. John Hart was here earlier. Uh, for more information, you can pick up a handout and visit us online at civilbee.org for full election coverage. And most important of all, if you haven't already done so, or uh, you know, you know about the primary, right? It's coming up <laughs> August 11th. You can vote absentee. You can walk in. There are so many ways to vote. It's up to you, gang. Uh, on behalf of Civil Beat, I'm Chad Blair. Take care and aloha. Aloha.
felt like we were speed dating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. So we can now relax.